just take a moment to welcome you to our service. For those of you who are watching online, we want to welcome you. That um, We say welcome to Connect. And um, my name is Stacy. My husband is Pastor Derek, but he is in West Virginia this morning preaching at a church that he oversees down there. So I have the privilege of talking to you today on our family fun day. And um, so we thought it would be fun to talk about what it takes to raise a family, seeing as how it's family fun day. So what, um, what qualifies me to... Um, speak up here today is I have a family. <laughs> That's about all. Um, but I have, so I, I have five kids, one of whom we acquired by law when my son married her back in March. Woohoo! She's a Brazilian beauty and I love her so much. And then we have, so that's my son's the oldest, and then we have three daughters, 22, 19, and 17. So what qualifies me is when there are many kids, there's much room for error. So that's why I'm standing here today. It's because I've made many errors. And um, it's not because I'm an awesome parent, although I do try to brainwash my kids to let them know that I am an awesome parent. Um, and it's not, I'm not qualified to teach up here because I think my kids are perfect because they're a bunch of sinners. And, but I love my little sinners. Um, but when I, when I had all four of my little sinners, um, when they were younger, I was like, you know what? Jesus, I came to the realization that Jesus changed the world with 12 disciples. And so I thought, I have a third of that. I can at least make a difference in my area with my own kids. So that's kind of when I purposed in my heart that I was going to raise champions. Hence, the Olympic video. I wanted to raise champions. And I don't mean just like gold medal Olympic champions, although I still might have one over here. I don't know. Um, but so I wanted to raise champions because raising good kids was just was not enough for me. And that was because I really... I had the heart of a champion. Now, most of you do not know this, but it was a goal of mine that I was going to be in the Olympics. I know you're probably like, what? <laughs> but let me just explain, I am all that in a bag of chips on the field. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but I really did want to be in the Olympics. I wanted to be, first I wanted to be an Olympic tennis player. And then um, I was going to be the next Tracy Austin. Anybody know who she is? Probably not. Oh, oh, thank you, Eric. Okay. <laughs> One person that's my age, um, but she was a tennis player, whatever. Okay, so then I got into middle school, and I started playing volleyball. And then I found my love and my passion for volleyball, so I thought, I'm going to be an Olympic volleyball player. And so my sophomore year in high school, I was going into my sophomore year, um, in 1986, our USA women's volleyball team brought home the silver medal. And there were two amazing leaders on that team, and so I was going to be one of them. I was going to be the next Flo Hyman. She was amazing, and she was known as the most vicious attacker, that's the person that spikes the ball, in the nation. The problem was that she was a six-foot-five African-American woman. <laughs> so I was like, I mean, I've got some good genes, but not that good. I can't be that good. So I thought, okay, I'll go to the next little person who was a five-foot-four setter. And I was like, okay, I can do that. I can do that. So that's what I was going to go after and be the next Olympic volleyball setter. But when I got to college, I realized, you know what, I don't even have the drive to, and the discipline to really sacrifice all that needs to be sacrificed in order to make it that far. So that's when I hung up my professional athletic career. <laughs> Wasn't really that professional. But, um, so, but I, that's when I decided I'm just going to play for fun. But I still had the champion heart in me, and I wanted to raise champion kids. So I was, um, from that time, from a little girl, I've always had a love and a passion because I'm just enthralled with the enormity of sacrifice that Olympians have to make. And not just the Olympians themselves, but the parents of the Olympians. And that's what we're going to talk about today is Olympic parenting. So um, parents of Olympians are very familiar with failure and seeing their kids fail. I mean, like on the video, you know, you can hear the whole crowd when something happens, they're like, <gasps> you know, a, a total gasp of everyone because no one likes to see their kids fail, much less anyone else. So, but parents of Olympians are very familiar with it. Olympians themselves are very, they're actually more successful at failing than they are at being successful. If you talk to them, um, not maybe just during the Olympics because they're still on a high like, woohoo, we're here, you know, but if you talk to them in a regular, if you Google any kind of um, interview with an Olympian when it's not during Olympic time, you will hear them like there, it's a lot, sometimes it's a lot of negativity. It's like, yeah, I fail every day. I make this, I mess this up. Every time I do this routine, there's something that I got to tweak. I don't do this perfectly. I'm never successful in this area because I always have to practice it. I have a broken bone and I'm still running around on it. I'm like, I don't even, what is that? But they're always willing to get back up and go again. Now, um, I'm going to tell you a little story about a girl. That's, her name is Gabrielle Douglas, and she was on our 2012 Olympic gymnastics team. And she's actually also going to Rio, where my Brazilian's at. Woohoo! 
the Olympics start in Brazil on August 5th. I know the date and the time, 7.30. Just catch one. But um, so this Gabrielle Douglas is going to Brazil to represent us as well. But let me just tell you her backstory a little bit. So when um, Gabrielle was 12 years old, she was watching the Olympics, and she saw this amazing gymnast that was doing all these flips and stuff, and she was like, I can do that. I think I can do that. And you know how, like, when... How many of you watch the Olympics, first of all? Just so... Okay. Oh, good. Okay. Um, so you know how, like, when somebody's about to take the floor, and they'll be like, okay, Bob Costas comes on in his little slow, you know, quiet voice, and he says, Nadia Comaneci is about to take the floor. Let's, before we see her routine, let's take a look back at what it took to get her here. And then it goes into this beautiful montage of like where she is in her country, in her hometown, and her family and her siblings. And it talks about the sacrifices that she's made. And, you know, it just, it's an awesome story. So when Gabrielle was 12 years old watching the Olympics, they showed this story of some gymnast, who, and it showed her coach that she was training with. And so Gabby was like, I think I can do that. And I can do that. And then it showed her coach, and she was like, you know what, I need that coach, and I can go to the Olympics. 12 years old, she had this drive. So she says to her mom, Mom, we need to move to Iowa, because this is where this coach was based out of, Des Moines, Iowa, and she lived in Virginia Beach. So she was like, Mom, we need to pick up and move to Iowa. <laughs> Much like I would have done with my kids. Uh, no. <laughs> no. And she was the youngest of four kids, a single mom, so even more so, my probably no would have been, uh, no. But... This is a Christian family that we're talking about. So um, they prayed about it a lot. And over the next two years, Gabby and her siblings, her siblings also saw the, the gift and the talents that Gabby had been given. And they were like trying to convince their mom, you know, mom, I think she has a really good shot at making it to the Olympics. So long story short, finally after two years, the mom decides, okay, you know what? I, I, think, I think you should go. So she lets her go. She, they didn't move the whole family, but she lets her go. She lives with a, um, a host home in Des Moines, Iowa, starts training with this coach that she saw on TV. And two years later, she was in the Olympics. So not only did she just make it to the Olympics, but she actually made history that year. She took home the gold medal for the all around. And she was the first, not only the first African-American woman to do that, but the first female of any color of any nationality to bring home the gold of it for the all around gymnast, which is awesome. And, that, and she made history, that's, and she made history in several different categories as well that year. And so can you imagine the mom, what the relief that she felt like, gosh, what if I didn't let her go? What if I didn't let her follow her dreams and see the potential in her? And I just was selfish and said, no, we're not, I'm not sacrificing that. Parents of Olympians sacrifice time and money and sometimes even emotional stability themselves to get their kids to the Olympics. And that's what we want to do as, as, as parents of champions is I want my kids to be gold medal winners in the lane that they're supposed to run in. And again, I don't mean with gold medal, you know, I'm talking figuratively, gold medal winner. Um, and this is where it brings me to my text for today is Philippians 3.14. It says, I press toward the goal to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want the best for my kids. I want them to run in their lane. I want them to achieve their intended end that God created them and designed them for. But it's not easy. And there's many obstacles and many failures and many mistakes along the way. And so that's what I want to tell you about today. Parents of Olympians are, are, are used to them failing, and, but they're used to also making them rise again. They encourage them and they push them to keep working hard and never give up. And De uh, Debbie Phelps, who is the mother of Michael Phelps, anybody heard of Michael Phelps? He's the great American swimmer. She, has this, she said this quote, the mark of a true champion is when you do falter, how do you come back to the surface again? So you always rise again. It reminds me of the scripture that says, you know, a righteous man falls seven times, but rises again. Champions rise again. So um, that's what I want to talk to you about today is Olympic parenting. And I'm going to give you the kind of the 30,000 foot view. This is not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination. It's actually hard to try to fit all you know into parenting in 40 minutes. <laughs> it's really, all I know is really not too much. But I'm gonna share with you some mistakes that I made. Um, so I'm gonna give you three techniques today that Olympic parents use to raise champions. The first one is active parenting. This is to be active in every aspect of your kids' lives. Now let me just pause here and say this. If you're not a parent, if you're a grandparent, be paying attention as if you are the parent. If you're not a parent, I have an assignment for you at the very end as well, and you can always get something out of it, so just everybody 
Everybody put your listening ears on. Okay, so active parenting, Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 and 7 says, These words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Basically, all day, every day. You are teaching, you are actively parenting your kids. So I'm going to give you three points under this first one. And the first A on your outline is enhance your relationship, your child's relationship with you. So this is basically having fun as a family. I think so many times as a parent, we, we get into the mode of like, do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that and all these lists of rules and regulations and I got to teach them at all times. But you know what? If your kids are not having fun, their little hearts don't, don't open up to you and then they're not really listening to all that you have to say. So make sure you're having fun. So um, that could be, you know, a movie night. It could be, you know, a putt-putt like the Brunsons just did the other night. It could be um, whatever interests your kids, find out what, that interests, what those interests are and do those things. And you might, if you have four kids, you're going to have four different interests. So you have to figure out what works for everybody. So let me tell you a little um, lesson that I learned uh, the hard way. I, we made kind of a hard, fast rule before um, Devin and Mallory got into public high school. We made a hard, fast rule that we were having fun. Friday, Friday night was going to be family fun night, and by golly, we were going to have fun, and you were going to like it. Okay, so Friday night, and nothing competes with family, you know. So Devin and Mallory get into high school. We're still making that hard, fast rule. Hard, fast rules in parenting don't work. You're going to hear me talk about the ebb and flow of parenting. That's when sometimes you have to change some things. Things need to shake it up a little bit. But oh no, I was an inexperienced parent, so I was like, Friday night is family fun night. So the other thing I learned the hard way is that my kids are not board game kind of people. <laughs> so on our Friday family fun night, Mallory's in ninth grade, Devin's in 10th, Madison and Morgan don't even know how to play Monopoly. I chose Monopoly. Like that was, I thought, well, this will be a long family fun night. It'll be good. We'll teach them how to play, and then they'll play it, and they'll love it. <laughs> okay, so we're playing the game, and it's just like a bickering fest. I mean, everybody's bickering and arguing, and I'm like, okay, my like levels are rising and rising. I'm like, we're supposed to be having fun. Stop arguing. Devin, stop doing that. Now there's Matt, some more. Just put your hotel on there. I don't know. You know, so it, it's escalating the whole time. And finally, Mallory, usually Devin gets the brunt of it, but he does. You'll hear him in his stories. Mallory finally goes, you know what? Just Devin, you want my boardwalk for like a dollar and park place for $2? I was like, what are you doing? Those are the most expensive. You can't do that. You have hotels. You have She's like, I don't want to play anymore. I was like, oh my gosh, you know. And I mean, it was just shy of the scene where Jesus was like turning over the tables in the temple and he was righteously indignant. And I was ready to like flip, you know, houses and hotels flying everywhere. And I think I probably ended with just everybody just go to your room. And I probably sat on the couch and cried, you know. But I was like, what in the world? We were supposed to be having family fun night. And it was, I was like, I had to learn, you have to do what they want to do. You have to make it fun, you know, if it's going to be family fun night. So, again, I learned the ebb and flow of parenting is we changed our family fun night because our kids wanted to be, like, at the football game on a Friday night with their friends in public high school. And I was like, I don't want you to be there. I want you to be with the family fun, you know. But I learned. So, here's the thing is that if you don't spend time with your kids when they're young, they won't want to spend time with you when they're older, and because kids spell love, T-I-M-E. They just want to spend time with you. And so make sure that you're having fun with your kids. Okay, so that's the first part in active parenting is you're going to enhance their relationship with you. The second thing on B is advance their relationship with God. And this is bringing God into every aspect of their lives. Don't just pray at bedtime and pray at the supper table. You know, that's great. But you need to be praying all, all day, every day. Pray in the morning when you're going to school. Pray for them when they're hurt. Pray for them when they're sick. Pray for their friends. Pray for their relationships. And one of the things that we did is um, we had several good, really good resources. One was our kids were in a Christian school, thank the Lord. And um, if I'm talking about parenting and children, you know I'm always going to plug my school because it's awesome. We have amazing teachers, and they learn Bible every single day. Like, this is so awesome. So not only did our kids go to Christian school, but um, where they learned Bible every day, but we also had these two resources that I want to tell you about. One was called Dan and Louie Stories. And this was a man and his dummy, like a puppet dummy. And they, he told stories. It was on cassette tapes. So in the third service, I'm going to have to explain what cassette tapes are because that's where all the young adults are. <laughs> They'll be like, what? What's that? But um, so we had um, Dan and Louie Stories, and it told hundreds of Bible stories. And so they would li listen to that at bedtime. They would play their tapes at bedtime. 
And then um, when they got a little bit older and they knew all the Bible stories like backwards and forwards, we switched to um, Focus on the Family. Anybody heard of that? Focus on the Family. Okay, they have what's called an Odyssey Adventures. And that kind of incorporates the faith and like biblical principles that they've learned into what lessons that they might be learning in their everyday life. So it might be friendships or it might be stealing or whatever. So it's kind of incorporating biblical principles. So we had those two kinds of resources that were just awesome. And it doesn't matter if it's a pastor preaching the word of God or if a Sunday school teacher or if it's a man and his dummy, the word of God does not return void. So you need to get it in them however you can. And those are two great resources. So if, you, if you're interested in those, you could go to danandlouisestories.com and those are... They have it on something other than cassette tapes now. <laughs> um, and then focusonthefamily.com as well, and you can look for Odyssey. But those are two great resources. So always bring God into everything because they're going to need a foundation and a faith to make it through, especially in this day and age. Okay? So that is to advance the relationship with God. C is influence your child's relationship with their friends. Now, this gets more important as they get older and as they're teenagers um, we, we always say, you know, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. We tell our kids, my, my husband says this, is um, friends will influence the course and direction of your life. And so you need to know your kids' friends' names. You need to know their parents. You need to know about them. And, you know, your, your house should be party central. We always wanted our place to be the place where all the kids wanted to come. So I always had a box of brownies. I always had chips and dip. I always had a soda. I always had water. Because when the kids came over, I wanted to feed them. Because if you feed kids, they like you. <laughs> so our house, we actually even turned one of our um, garage bays into a living room downstairs so that our kids could have a place that they could go um, and to be able to have the kid cave, you know. And so it's worked well for us over the years. Um, but it's, it was an investment, and it was well worth it because we want our kids to, you know, I mean, our house to be kid central. Now, the other thing that you can learn about your kids' friends is if your child ever texts you or calls you and says, hey, mom, can we take Billy home? Can we give him a ride after practice? Your answer always needs to be yes. Because you can learn a lot about Billy riding home in a car, especially after a game that they've lost. You're like, what? Don't, we don't say that in this car, you know. <laughs> but you can learn a lot from just hanging around their friends. So always take their kids' friends' homes. If they live, I mean, we live in towns up here, which down where I'm from, it's like, if you're taking a kid home, it could be like an hour, you know, out of your way. Here, it's like seven minutes max. So, well, for some of you have bigger towns, Ashland, whatever. Okay, so take your kids' friends home. Anytime you can be involved in their kids' friends' lives, do it. It's, it will serve you well. You can't avoid your kids having friends, but you can guide and direct them when they're in those relationships if you know their kids well and their, their friends well, I mean. So be active in every aspect of your kids' lives. All right, the second technique that we're going to talk about for Olympic parenting is to be attentive, attentive parenting. And this is, um, how many of you have kids like five and under? Okay, lots of you, all right. So what's funny is that when your kids are young, it's always a constant battle between like going to bed early and catching up, to, catching up on sleep, or do I stay up late and have some alone time? And because you're so tired, you can hardly pay attention. <laughs> and then when they turn teenagers and young adults, then you actually have to take a nap before their curfew so that you can be attentive enough when they come home from curfew to be like, okay, let me, let me smell your breath. Let me look at your eyeballs. Are you, you know, what are you, who have you been with? What's 14 times three? Quickly? No. <laughs> But you have to be attentive, okay? And so um, sometimes when you're parenting teenagers, it's like nailing jello to the wall. <laughs> it's, again, the ebb and flow. You got to figure some things out. But Proverbs 22, 6 in your notes says this, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, notice it doesn't say train up children in the way they should go. It says train up a child. So my child, this one is different from this one. So I have to train this one to go this way. I have to train this one to go this way. It's a lot of work. And so you have to, therefore, you have to pay careful attention. So the first part is careful observation under your notes on A. Each child is different. You got to figure out like what works best to ground them. Oh my gosh, that was like, uh, we needed an org chart to figure out what we had tried before and what didn't work and what worked for this child, what didn't work for this child. So some of them, we'd take away money and they'd be like, okay. Some of them, we'd take away the TV and they're like, oh, fine. Some of them would say, you can't go to your friends. I'm like, no. We're like, yes, we got it. That's what makes them tick. Okay. 
Write that down on the org chart, you know? But you gotta figure out what area they're supposed to be a champion in, what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what gets them mad, what works for the groundings, you know? And then you gotta, you know, kind of still keep on paying attention to those things. Um, point B here on the attentive parent is cherish the moments. This is huge. This is like car rides, bedtimes, supper time, story time, all those kinds of things. And one of the things that we did at supper time was we incorporated the favorite part of the day. So we'd go around the table. Now, granted, we haven't had like all seven of us now that Natalia's in the family, but, um, but like once since they've been married. Um, but when they were younger, we had supper time every night. And so we went around the table and we'd talk about the favorite part of the day. Well, then, you know, as they're getting older, I was like, well, I need to ask some thought-provoking questions. So I'd ask, like, okay, so um, what makes you sad when you see, you know, a dead squirrel on the road or whatever? You know, I'm not, I obviously didn't say that one because I'm a good mom. No. Um, but we, I thought of thought-provoking questions. Well, every time, one of them would go, oh, my gosh, mom, that's so stupid. Why do we have to answer? Okay, wait, I'm giving it away by my voice. Hold on. Oh my gosh, mom, like, why do we have to do this? This is so dumb, you know? So literally just within the last two months, we were all on the back porch and they start going, can y'all believe that? Isn't that so funny how mom would always make us like answer these dumb questions at the supper table? <laughs> Guess which one, which child that was? And I was like, you know what? When y'all are family, when y'all have your own families and you're doing the same thing around the supper table, I'm going to sit there and go, uh-huh, I told you, I taught you that. Because I, I created moments for you, I created traditions, and you are going to carry on the same thing. So make fun of me again, and I'm going to laugh at you when you're doing it, you know? But parents of Olympians, if, if I stopped every time my kids made fun of me, they wouldn't, I, I wouldn't even be here. They'd probably be strangled along the side of the road, too. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm godly. Um, <laughs> again, you're learning from my mistakes, okay? So... Stop judging me. No, I'm kidding. Um, but those are the things, those are the moments that they remember. So you can make fun of me all you want to, but you remember them, and you're going you're gonna to do it with your kids. And I'm going to laugh. So, but one of the things about um, cherishing the moments is you got to actually be there in order to cherish the moments. So quantity time leads to quality time. Now, my kids are all older now, and they don't need me as much, which is supposed to happen, because that means I've done a good job if they're not coming to me with every little thing. You know, they're starting to process some things on their own. And, but when I come home from work in the afternoons, I am there for my kids. They might not need me four days out of five, but on that fifth day, if I'm not there and they need me, I lose an opportunity. And if you lose too many opportunities with a teenager or an adolescent, you're not going to get them anymore. They'll be like closed off. She's not there. Whatever. I have to do this on my own. So I, the parent of a champion is there for their kids when they need them. So let me tell you a little funny story that was well, not so funny. You might think I'm a little bit crazy, but that's okay. Um, so the day that Devin moved out was February 1st, back in February. And up until leading up, it was a Monday morning. Up until that point, like the, the week leading up to that point, there was a milestone in all five of my kids' lives. Five, again, being Natalia. For those of you who are like, you only have four. But so that Thursday leading up to that week was um, Madison had just chosen. She's the 19-year-old. She had just chosen and, and decided that she was going to go to Alabama and spread her wings a little bit for the summer, which we encouraged her to do. We really, like, shoved her out and were like, no, you're, you need to go. Because she's like, I'm ready. I'm, all, I'm okay. I'm going to stay here. Again, I have to train up a child on the way he should go. If she, Whatever. I'm getting off of my... Okay. So anyway... <laughs> We sent her, she, she had just decided, she, yes, she will go to Alabama. And then um, Friday and Saturday of that week leading up to Devin moving out was Morgan and I had started looking online at different colleges where we were going to choose to, you know, um, what colleges we were going to tour. So, and that's my baby. So then I'm, I'm starting to think, oh my gosh, I'm in college. Like, I'm going to be an empty nester at some point? Probably not for a long time, but I'm supposed to be an empty nester. Okay. So, and then... Saturday, no, that was Friday and Saturday. Morgan and I did the college stuff. Then Sunday, we had Natalia's bridal shower, which was huge and awesome. And then Monday, Devin was moving out. And then a month later, Mallory was going to be moving back home from she, who she was in Alabama. So it was like one thing after another. And the whole weekend, I'm just going and going and going. So Monday morning comes, we pack Devin up. He's in the box truck. I'm driving behind him. And I get about three miles down the road, and all of a sudden... I burst into tears. Now, I'm not a big crier, not at all. And it wasn't even like, a, oh, I, I feel a little bit of something coming up. No, it was just like, 
<laughs> I mean, and if I told you how bad it was, you would think she has no business being up there on that stage. <laughs> wow. I mean, I was shocked at myself. So shocked I had to call my own mom and go, what is the matter with me? What is going on? I'm like telling her all this stuff. And um, she was like, honey, I don't even know what to say to you right now. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, my mom doesn't even know what to say. So, um, so I kind of moved the car over behind the box truck so Devin can't see me out of his mirrors because he would have been like, what is the matter with her? I can't take her anywhere. But I'm still, I'm still like, why am I crying? I'm not even sad. I am so happy that he's moving out. This is an awesome day, you know. And I'm like, I'm, and then I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we're about to get to Frank and Christina's house, who are Natalia's parents, because we're going to get some more stuff out of their house to put in the truck, you know, move Natalia fully out of their house. And um, she wasn't moving in, by the way, because this is a month before they're married. So just so you know. Okay, so, but we're moving all Natalia's stuff in while we have the trucks. So we get, I'm thinking, I'm going to get there and they're going to see me like crying and they're going to think, oh, she's so sad that her, you know, her son's moving. And I was like, I got to call Natalia. So I call Natalia while I'm boohooing. And I'm like, Natalia, you got, I've been crying. I have no idea why. I'm just, I just wanted to tell you it's not about you. I'm so excited. I'm so glad that he's yours now. And you get to take care of him. I was like, it's just so awesome. But I'll tell you what was happening. I realized afterwards is that is if you, let's cut to the Olympics. If you, at the moment that an Olympian realizes that they've clinched the gold medal, usually they cut the camera to the parent if the parent's in the stands. And they're like jumping up and down as if they've won it themselves. And they're crying and they, they're just like out of their mind so happy. And it's because Gabrielle Douglas's mom has said this. She said, it's like in that moment, you go, it was all worth it. Oh my gosh, this is so awesome. You know, I've won, I've won the gold medal. Your child has really won it, but you feel like you've won it. So that was what was happening to me in the moment. It was like this emotional release. It was like I could literally almost hear the last page of that chapter closing. And I was moving on to the next chapter. I was like, I've done a good job. I deserve this. This is awesome. But I couldn't even control myself because I was so happy that my son had chosen this amazing wife, that my son was moving out, moving on to the next chapter, that each one of my daughters were moving on to the next chapter. I'd done a good job. And it was just this emotional release. It was crazy, but it was an emotional release and awesome. So if that's not enough, we, we you know, started moving at 10 o'clock in the morning and at 10 o'clock at night, we were almost finished. 12 hours of a long, hard working day. So I'm, I'm, um, at 9 o'clock, we had gone to um, get some groceries. So Devin and I were going to get groceries, cherish the moment. Again, he'd never done that before. So that was, uh, that's a whole different message, just telling you what he learned at the grocery store. So we went to get groceries, and Natalia went to get, like, the shower curtain and all the stuff that you need for the house. And so at, at 10, like, 10.30, we got back home, put all the stuff away. We were finished. I was getting ready to pack up my stuff to go home because I was exhausted and done. And I get a text from one of my daughters that says, when are you coming home, Mom? I need you. And I knew exactly what had happened. And I was, at the moment, I was like, oh, Jesus, give me grace and give me wisdom because I got nothing left. So the whole way home, I was praying. I get home. I walk into her room. She just falls in my arms and starts boo-hoo crying. Now, can you imagine if I said, honey, I'm just so tired. Can we talk about this tomorrow? (laughs) Opportunity lost. Like walls would go up. You, you cherish the moments, and it doesn't matter how much you have to sacrifice, you cherish the moments. Because when you have a teenager, you can't make them talk to you when it's convenient for you. You listen to them when they're at their wit's end, when they're in crunch time. And so that's what Olympic parents do is they sacrifice often. And they have to, they have to be these active parents and attentive parents. So point C right here is kind of goes on this off of this, um, the last point is to be consistent. You have to be consistent. Kids are watching their parents to see if there's consistency in their lives. They're watching what you say and to see if it measures up with your actions. So are you telling your kids to not fight with their siblings, but yet you're fighting with their, with your spouse? They're watching. Are you telling your kids to forgive each other, but yet you hold a grudge against your boss or your coworker or your spouse? They're watching. 
uh, this is one, this is a whole different message in and of itself as well. Are you telling your kid that you're going to discipline the next time they do something and then it happens and then you're like, oh, I'm too tired. It's kind of an inconvenience. I'm just going to let it go. They're watching. They are sniff, snell, sniffing you out and smelling fear and smelling inconsistent. They are smart little boogers. I tell you, they're like sharks. They're watching and waiting, you know. They are sizing you up. They're seeing if you're consistent. And if you're not consistent, they're going to, all of a sudden, it's like when a child starts seeing inconsistency, they don't know this, this feeling or they don't understand how to explain that I have such disrespect for you. All they know is I either love you or I hate you. Therefore, I hate you because I have this yucky feeling in my heart towards you because you're inconsistent. I disrespect you, and so kids will say, I hate you. Now, there's plenty of times where kids will say, you know, I hate you because you've doled out a discipline that they don't like, but they respect you. That kind of hate goes away. They end up learning, my mom means what she says, and she says what she means. So that's a different kind of, you know, that's just kind of a passing hate. But kids who really do have such disrespect for their parents, it starts out with they think they just hate them, and it's all because parents are not consistent. Parenting is not for the popularist, it's for the prize winner. You have to go and do and sacrifice and always be consistent. And then the last one to piggyback on this is the consistency is to stay the course. Okay, so Holly Wagner uh, uh, just posted the other day, she said, it's okay to want to quit, but just don't quit. I mean, do you know how many times we wanted to quit and give up on parenting or on our marriage? But we didn't, thank God we didn't. This applies to us as parents or, you know, to us to encourage our children to stay the course, but we also have to stay the course because they're watching. We need to stay the course. And the, the um, best way to do that, for those, well, let me tell you, Gabri Gabrielle Douglas had said that before the 2012 Olympics, again, she was in Iowa, if you remember back to 20 minutes ago, um, she was in Iowa and she wanted to um, come home. She was like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm exhausted, you know. So she calls her mom, tells her she wants to come home, and her mom's like, no, you are not coming home. You are staying there. You have sacrificed too much. We have sacrificed too much. You are a champion. You are going to make it to the Olympics. You're going to stay the course. And Gabrielle Douglas says in this interview, she's like, I was so mad at my mom. She's like, you're not letting me even come home? She's like, no, I'm not letting you come home. You're going to stay the course. And so Gabrielle said, I, I finally forgave her after a couple of days. And she was so glad that her mom pushed her to stay the course. That's what parents of champions do. And one of the ways, one of the best ways that you can stay the course for your kids and to be the example is to stay married. Have a healthy marriage. Healthy marriages produce healthy children. And healthy children produce healthy families. And healthy families produce healthy societies. And God knows we need healthier societies right now. And so it all starts with just staying the course in your marriage. And you may be divorced and, um, you know, or going through a divorce or whatever, and there is no judgment here. Listen, uh, the Bible says, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. That means sometimes it's just not possible to live peaceably with someone. Uh, I, I get that. Again, that's a marriage seminar. But... Um, you know, as much as life and you live peaceably with all men, stay married to somebody if at all possible. Have a healthy marriage in order for your kids to see what it looks like. They will have some of the best, um, just, I call it chutzpah. They'll have the best chutzpah to be able to stay in a marriage when it gets tough for them if you've stayed in your marriage. Now, let's say, let's say that you are divorced or you have kids with, if, divorce can be very ugly when you have kids. And you probably all have, know someone that, you know, has walked through that. And it's really tough. And the best thing you can do is if you are divorced, if you, if you couldn't stay together, at least work together for your, the sake of your kids. Don't ever put your kids in the middle of a divorce. If you have friends that are doing that, challenge them to say, hey, you know what? It's best if your kids don't feel any weight of this divorce on them. Kids automatically have a way of feeling like it's their fault. If the parents are working together, it won't affect them as greatly as if you stay the course in that way. So again, just stay the course with your kids, be the examples for them. And, and then the last point here, after being active and attentive, is we need to be effective parents. So effective means to adequate to accomplish a purpose, producing the intended or expected result. Now, God gave us the one, these children, and he knows best how to help them. So 
We need to ask him in order to, how do I parent this child? You know, I would always tell the Lord, there are so many details. I just feel like given up because I failed so many times. But because I'm an Olympic parent, I got back up and I would go again. And so I started asking the Lord, give me, give me some prayers because I'm not really a huge detail person. And I felt like I am just missing the mark on all these details, all these things that I need to teach my kids. So I came up with, I, I put down four prayers here for you that, um, that kind of just, cover a lot of areas, okay? So if, if there was nothing else that you could take away, I wanted you to be able to take away some of these prayers. So the first one there is pray Luke 2.52. And this is talking about Jesus' childhood. There's not, much about in, there's not much in the Bible about Jesus' childhood, but this is one verse that talks about his childhood, and it says, he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. Three very important things. They, they would have wisdom, good, healthy, physical bodies, and then favor with God and man. B, pray for wisdom beyond their years and character that's pleasing to God. Okay, this is, I came up with this because I was like, well, God gave me this because I'm really not that smart on my own. But God gave me, I thought, you know, if my kids are facing situations that they don't know what to do, Lord, they need wisdom beyond their years. And then I felt like sometimes when you have wisdom, you still don't do it because you have bad character. So you're willing to like sacrifice the wisdom that you know and just still go ahead and do it. So I was like, okay. So if they have wisdom beyond their years, but character that's pleasing to you, that will kind of cover every situation that they come into face, you know, come, come into contact with. So um, C, next one is pray that your child has a teachable spirit. If, if your child has a teachable spirit, then you can teach them everything else that they need to know. <laughs> I mean, that's like how to be a hard worker. You should be a tither, you know, proper body care. Don't be judgmental. How to throw a football, whatever it is. You know, they, if they're teachable, you can teach them everything. And that covers everything else that you need to teach them because there's so much that you have to teach them. And then the last one, last prayer is pray with a futuristic perspective. So when you are when you first conceive, pray for your child. There, there's a book called What to Expect When Expecting, and it goes through every month what's forming and developing in your little baby. And I would go through that book, and I would pray every detail of what was forming. Lord, give them good eyesight. Lord, let their liver work. I don't even know what it does, but let their liver work. Lord, give them good heart, good strong heart, good strong muscles. Like everything, go through de de the details and pray every aspect of your child's formation. And, then, and I had really, really unbelievably healthy kids. I mean, my doctor would always go, I've never, I've never given a 10 in the APGAR, but your child's getting a 10 in the APGAR. It's like, yes, we're champions already. Um, but so then, um, you know, once they're born and they're like, you know, you have a, you have a three to five year perspective and, and you're praying over them that they will develop normally and be good, strong, healthy kids and have the mind of Christ and have a good vocabulary and all the kind of stuff that you need to think during those three to five years. And then when they hit about age five, you start thinking five to 10 years down the road. And you pray for their friends and you pray for a good work ethic and you pray that they would do well in school and that they would have favor with their teachers and all those kinds of things. And then here's the one thing that you need to pray from the time that they are conceived, but this is a really long futuristic perspective, is pray for their spouse. The most important your, your child. The, the two most important decisions your child will make is the first of all, to have Jesus be the Lord and Savior of their life. That's the best thing that your child can do, best decision your child can make. The next best decision, or it needs to be the best decision, is who they marry. Because the spouse that they marry all of a sudden takes the place of that Olympic parent that has been the encourager and the supporter and the cheerleader and the stay the course and we're going to do this. That's the spouse that comes, the, the spouse takes that parent's place as that role. And if, you're, if the spouse is not that kind of person and tears their spouse down, then your child will not achieve the intended result. That's what they need. The spouse is so important. And so we prayed for a long time. And, and don't just pray for the spouse, but pray for the parents. We would pray for our kids from the time that our kids were born or conceived, really, but born and they were little and we'd pray in the bedtime prayers. And we'd say, and Lord, I pray for their spouse that you would bring them about in the right timing. And I pray for their parents. I pray for their child's parent, that they would be raising them in the nurture and admonition, admonition of the Lord. So when Devin and, and um, Natalia got engaged, I was like, oh, I've been praying for y'all your whole, my whole life, you know, my kid's whole life. This is awesome. Because it's so important. If you wait till you're, they're like 17, 18, when they start thinking about dating or, parent, or um, wanting to get married, there's not a lot of foundation in those couple of years that you can pray, even if you prayed every single day. I was like, thank God I prayed for 23 years, you know, for a spouse. Because it's the most important decision that they'll make. 
Okay, so that's the, the covering of all the, the prayers that you want to pray. But here's the, here's the end all, be all, because this covers everything. And I want you to write this down. It's not in your notes. The bonus material is you need to pray, cover my mistakes. I can't tell you how often I prayed that because, I mean, I would lose that. As you can tell, sometimes I was a little, as my husband would say, I have a little salsa. But I was just like, Lord, cover my mistakes. I just, I, I make so many of them, cover them. And he does. And but here's the one thing is that make sure that you, if you make mistakes, apologize to your kids. Don't be afraid to apologize. In fact, you should be afraid to not apologize to your kids when you make mistakes because it keeps them tender towards you. I made all kinds of mistakes and my kids still all absolutely love me. <laughs> they do, they really do. Um, but uh, for those of you who've been here long, uh, long enough to know, you know, we, um, we had some very testy years with our son during his teen years. And now he is leading the young adults and youth ministry here. Um, and he's doing an awesome job and we're so proud of him. And what's interesting though is, you know, I look back and I go, thank God I never gave up. Thank God you gave me the grace to walk through it. And I, I can tell you this, I, I never would have made it without Jesus. I never, Devin never would have made it alive without Jesus. <laughs> um, but what's really cool is that this morning we're celebrating another gold medal for us. And that this is the first time, Devin's not even here today, Devin and Natalia, because he's speaking at another church. This first, first Sunday morning that he's speaking at a church in Canton, the link. And um, so we're celebrating. We're, we're winning a you know, gold medal here. But I'm just glad that Olympic parents don't give up. I, I, God gave me the wisdom to not give up because I knew that he was going to make a difference in people's lives. I'm, not, I'm never going to give up on any of my daughters because they're going to achieve great things as well. And I, if you'll just put your notes away and you can stand with me. Um, while I tell you this last little bit, during the last several years, um, I, I've been coaching volleyball at the high school, and um, when I'm there or when I'm at my kids, you know, different kids' games or just the football games, because again, I'm going to be in their environment, I'm going to know their kids in their environment, and you can learn a lot when you go to the kids' football games, and you're attentive. Um, but I would see Devin's and Mallory's former coaches and teachers, and, and there were several of them that came up to me, and they'd say, you know, they follow them on social media, so they're seeing all their things that they're doing. And they're like, Stacy, I want my kids to be just like yours. You've got to tell me what I need to do. And I'm like, first of all, you, you probably could, should aim a little higher for, you know, what my, but I always, tell, I always say, you know what? First of all, you need Jesus. You need Jesus, because I couldn't have made it without the grace of God in my life. And then secondly, you need to start praying now and never give up. But I want to tell you the same thing this morning. It doesn't matter if you're a parent or if you're, if you're not a parent. You need Jesus in every aspect of your lives. And let me tell you a verse that um, I think I skipped over it. But it's um, Ephesians 6, 18. It, on, it, and this is on your, it's in your notes. It says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. If you're not a parent, pray for those of us who are, because we are raising the next generation of leaders. We're raising the future's leaders, and God knows we need some better leaders to choose from, okay? <laughs> Moving on. So we, you, if you're not a parent, if you're a grandparent, if you're single, if you're a young adult, Start praying for your own kids if, you're, if you haven't had kids yet or if you don't have kids. Pray for those of us who do. Pray for those who are um, kids' church workers who are pouring their lives out on a weekly basis. Pray for teachers. Pray for parents because we need your prayers. We covet your prayers. We can't do it just in ourselves. And so like I said, I want to say that everyone needs Jesus. It doesn't matter. It's not just for parenting. It's for if you might be facing something at work, if you might have a difficulty in your marriage or relationships, or you got a bad report from the doctor, Jesus covers it all. He covers all our mistakes. He covers all the things that we face in our lives. So I just want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want to give you an opportunity this morning that if you've never asked Jesus to be at the center of your life, to be at the helm, at the wheel of your life, I want to give you an opportunity this morning and with every head bowed and eye closed, just to give the person on your right and your left a little bit of privacy to have this moment, I'm going to ask you if you want to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life because it can change everything. It's the best decision that you will make ever because it seals your eternity with him. It gives you hope along the way when you're traveling through some life's difficulties. 
So if that is you, I would like for you to just raise your hand. I'm not going to call you down or embarrass you or anything. Just raise your hand and say, I want to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I see your hand, buddy. I see your hand in the middle. That's awesome. I see your hand in the back. That's so great. Both of you, that couple. Thank you, Jesus. I see you, ma'am. Thank you. That is awesome. It's the best decision that you will make. You know, the angels, it says in the Bible that the angels are rejoicing when someone comes home to the Lord. And this will bring such a, um, a joy to your life and a peace. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask all of our brothers and sisters to pray with me. So everybody just repeat after me. Dear Lord, I thank you for what you did for me on the cross. And I say right now that you are the Lord and Savior of my life. I put my life in your hands and I trust you with everything. I give it all to you. And I ask you to just help me and guide me through everything in my life. In Jesus' name. And I want to pray for those of you. I just, um, I'm just going to pray and you can just join with me in, in your hearts. But Lord, I just ask that you would help each one of us in here that has, um, I thank you for the, the most important decision that these people made to come into the kingdom of God. And now, Lord, I ask that you would just minister peace to them in every area of their lives, Lord Jesus. I pray that you would help each of the parents in here, that you would give them an Olympic parenting paradigm, that they would never give up, that they would mine for their talents of their kids, that they would be able to um, encourage their kids to be run in the lane that they're supposed to, to achieve the gold medal. And Lord, not only when our children achieve the gold medal, but we achieve the gold medal as parents. And Lord, I ask that you would just bless this church in Jesus' name with godly parents and godly kids, godly families in Jesus' name. You said, Lord, that you set the lonely in families. And so we thank you, Jesus, that our church is a family and that we welcome these new brothers and sisters in Christ in here. And we just thank you for this day. Ask that you would just bless it the rest of this day, the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen.